My name is Molly. I'm a cold stove that warms gradually. <laughs> it's a great joy to be with you all. In a time of renewal and planning, I sense your passion and your deep investment in the future of this organization. And that matters greatly. I came a bit early so they could offer a few more of the kudjas to me. Uh, actually, I came early because I wanted to listen uh, to your process. I wanted to listen to the heartbeat of the organization and what, uh, what you sense to be on the horizon through the holy nudge of the Spirit. And so I have been blessed by being with you uh, for this day and a half or so. I regret I won't be able to be here all week. Uh, we have a faculty retreat that is starting tomorrow afternoon. And uh, presidents know it's important not always to let the faculty uh, go untended. <laughs> <laughs> Do I have a witness? <laughs> all right. <laughs> You have a text uh, already selected for our time, but I want to add one to it. I want to add from the prophet Isaiah, Isaiah 43, verses 18 and 19. Do not remember the former things or consider the things of old. All right. I'm about to do a new thing. Yeah. Yeah. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. <coughs> and from Matthew 9, 9, 17. Neither is new wine put into old wine skins. Otherwise the skins burst. And the wine is spilled, and the skins are destroyed. But new wine is put into fresh wine skins, and so both are preserved. Yes. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our attitudes about new things are radically disparate. Some of us love new cars, new shoes, new books, new technology, new wallets. Well, no, I never met a man who wanted a new wallet. <laughs> but we can get really fearful when we consider new expressions of worship, mm. gathered community, mm. organizational structure, mm. or God forbid, a new theological perspective. Oh. Oh. Some things just need to stay put. Yeah. <laughs> Newness, however, is the medium of God's handiwork mm. in this dying and rising creation. Mm. Newness is the medium of God's handiwork in the paschal rhythms of a groaning creation. Mm. Now you have actually produced some new cells since this sermon began. And a few have died. Too. Hopefully they were not brain cells <laughs> dying because of boredom. <laughs> the prophet stated God's message clearly. Do not remember the former things. Consider the things of old. I'm doing a new thing. Shall you not know it? All right. mm -hmm. Often when a church or ministry embarks on a discernment process, it drags along years of conflict or discouragement, which cloud our eyes to the possibilities before us. 
I didn't sense that in our conversation yesterday or today. Yet we know that the mixing of the old and the new is risky business, but necessary. Come on. Life is a continuum grounded in the past, radically open to the future with the help of the Spirit. Amen. Oh, with right. the help of yes. the Spirit. Now the text about new wine and new wineskins comes at the end of a long series of teaching about discipleship, part of which occurred at a dinner party at Matthew the tax collector's house. New convert, he was, right. you recall. And there's a bit of contest uh -huh. between the disciples of John the Baptist and those gathering around Jesus. And the issues of old and new practices are what are at the fore. Uh, Jesus table manners. He ate with sinners, you know. He liked feasting more than fasting, it appears. And he has that statement about the bridegroom, and you don't you don't go on a fast well, when you ought to be throwing a party. All right. But John John's disciples they fast, said the Pharisees, and you have a sense that Jesus' words are creating conflict, even while setting in motion a new community. Wow. <laughs> now, actually. There are three different places this wine and wineskins tech shows up. You know, you've got a Lucan and a Markan and a Mathia. I wonder if it's pretty by one of them. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, Matthew tweaks Mark's version of a saying. In Mark 2.22, the intent is for new wine new wineskins. Real clear. But Matthew adds this interesting phrase. What do you say? So both are preserved. Yeah. Now, is he just talking about wine and wineskins or is there something else that Matthew is thinking? Now here is where holy imagination comes in the book. Come on now. It seems yes. <laughs> that this writer wants to preserve a measure of continuity mm. with what has gone before, even though this further word, so both are preserved, provokes ambiguity. Mm. Perhaps he is saying that the old can be preserved only by means of the new. Mm -hmm. Let me say that again. Yes, yeah. Perhaps he is saying that the old can be preserved only by means of the new. Mm -hmm. Apparently, Matthew does not want to lose the old. If you have read the gospel carefully, you know all the great images, new Torah, new Moses, new Sermon, not Sinai, but the Mount, new. But the old, what if we assume that the old relates to the pre-common era 70 Judaism, when you know everything changes at the destruction of the temple? What if the old relates to the Hebrew Bible? Israel's history, the temple, the land, etc. Maybe the addition reflects Matthew's conviction that this tradition will best be preserved by this new movement centered around Jesus. What if that is the improvisation that's going on here? For Matthew and other Jewish Christians, the only way to move into the future without the temple and without direct control of the land was to take Jesus and his teaching as the guide. 
You see, we think Matthew's probably written at the, at the end, toward the end of the first century. And there is a community that is beginning to experience diaspora. Mm -hmm. Perhaps the only way to move into the future without temple, without land, without the ritual space was to take Jesus and his teaching and move forward. What appeared to some Jews as scandalous novelty was in fact the way in which both old and new are preserved. All right. Now usually, when we read this text, we focus on the new wineskin, yes. a metaphor for what contains the gospel, and we spend a great deal of time talking about the form, the form that our church, the form that our institution, the form that our ministry will take. But I wonder whether reflection on new wine might be more profitable for us at this time of inflection for churches and denominations. We expect wineskins to flex. <laughs> but does not wine also elude rigidity, inflexibility? Well, I wanted to order some books on winemaking but I fear they'd be delivered to Central. <laughs> and so some of this is, uh, once again, imaginative. <laughs> Word with Doc. Word with Doc. <laughs> when I was a student uh, at Cambridge, um, shortly after the earth cooled, when I was doing <laughs> I learned of a wonderful practice. It's the third Thursday of November mm. when there's a great race from France over to England to see who can bring the first Beaujolais Nouveau. My, my, my. That new wine that is only fermented about seven or eight weeks. It tastes like bad communion juice. <laughs> And the thing about that kind of wine, the Beaujolais Nouveau, it really never gets any better. Yeah. <laughs> and that's why they try to sell it off real quick. <laughs> that's why they, why they have this contest, who can get it first. Whoever gets it first can get rid of it first. <laughs> but not, that's not usually how wine works. Mm. Usually there's a longer process. Yes, yes. I'm told. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to suggest several ways in which this new wine entrusted to us may be fermenting in our time. People are thirsty. For the new wine of experiential practice rather than theoretical abstractions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, a week ago, Thursday, I was part of an interfaith panel entitled A Buddhist, a Jew, and a Christian Walk into a Room, <laughs> which sounds like the beginning of a really bad sure. joke. We shared our distinctive pathways of faith, both contrast and complement. And then we opened up conversation with those who had gathered. What persons were most interested in was our personal spiritual practice. Their eyes had glazed at some of the linguistic gymnastics and theological thickets we had wandered into. They wanted to know how we sought and how we encountered God. Amen. Now there was some sharpening of difference, but I thought I have just seen a portal into the state of spirituality 
among the seekers of, of American religion, religious folk. They were interested in practice. How might we experience God? And to me, that is a bubbling and transformative kind of horizon. At the same time, what I heard that evening has impact for us. There's a cry in our day for the new wine of faith that has ethical import. Younger adults want to know what difference faith communities are making in the world. What are the concrete outcomes of mission giving? Better yet, how might they get involved in transformative action themselves? In the urgent humanitarian crisis assembling on America's southern border, some church groups are investing resources and personnel to alleviate suffering. I have wondered, what if every congregation would take in one family unit? We could say, we will take care of these children. You, the government, find a way to make it legal. Imagine if churches were to take such a stand, a new credibility among younger adults would emerge. People are hungry for the new wine of ethical impact. I also sense the yearning for the new wine of improvisational faith. And I'm not talking about the kind of thing uh, that Robert Bella documented a number of years ago, Habits of the Heart. Remember, he studied these various things, and there was a woman who invented her own religion, Sheila, Sheila-ism. I'm glad she wasn't named Judy. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) New wine of improvisational faith. And I don't mean simply being a theological magpie that steals what appeals to us out of another's nest without worldview and biblical narrative, etc. attached. But the Bible itself offers this improvisational uh, pattern and permission. A long hermeneutical history of this. The New Testament writers needed to find new ways to speak of God's great redemptive project in a groaning world and they mined not only the Hebrew Bible but also the cultural forms of their epic. Earlier today we looked at 2 Corinthians 5. Well the language of reconciliation, the language of being an ambassador etc. etc. We can understand that. Well that first century Greco-Roman mores Paul mined his culture in a way to express the gospel. The gospel always takes root in a cultural context and serves to strengthen what is commendable and to prune what is an affront to human dignity as image of God. Strengthen, prune. There's a dialectic. Mm. I've learned a great deal about this from Doctor of Ministry students at Myanmar Institute of Theology. They don't like to hear that there was nothing culturally commendable about their encounters with God Mm. prior to the conversation with missionaries. Wow. Mm. If we take this new wine of improvisational faith, we might have to address critical issues of our time. In a time that begs for a new theology of human sexuality, both gender relations and identity, 
a new theology of creation, a new theology of religious pluralism, just to mention a few <laughs> of the easier ones. <laughs> the spirit is inspiring improvisation. We revere Holy Scripture, and rightly we should, yet perceive that it provides patterns for adaptation more than dogma for all time. James McClendon, arguably the most creative Baptist theologian of the 20th century, wrote this. Doctrine is what the church needs to teach now in order to be the church. Doctrine is what the church needs to teach now in order to be the church. He understood teaching, doctrine, as dynamic, suffused with the transgressive power of the Spirit. When we get serious about the Holy Spirit, sisters and brothers, we soon learn nothing stays put. Mm-hmm. Nothing. That is one of the Spirit's favorite activities, wow. is transgressing boundaries that we have set up. Mm-hmm. Oh, God. Oh, that's good. Oh. Ron Rollheiser, a priest friend of mine, has written a wonderful book entitled Holy Longing. And he speaks about the ways in which our longings fire our desire for unity with God, for richness of life, for true community. One of those longings is a pervasive thirst for the new wine of playful joy. As we met yesterday to pray about what would happen while we we're here together, uh, there were a couple of PSs to the prayers, and may we have some fun in, in the process. Truly. Johann Sebastian Bach put it this way, when I have lost my joy, I have lost my connection with God. Mm. Wine and joy are often associated in the scripture. Yeah. Jesus is the giver of joy, yeah. along with some very good wine, according to the fourth gospel. It's a gift offered, not grass. We don't manufacture joy. It's the effulgence. It is the pouring yeah. out. Yes. It is the great gift. That's right. That's right. It is the wellspring that surges up from the indwelling of God's own presence in our lives. As Mary Oliver writes, if you suddenly and unexpectedly feel joy, don't hesitate. Give in to it. Joy is not made to be a crumb. It is to be that which nourishes us and goes along with this new wine of which we speak. When I became president of Central uh, nearly 10 years ago, I went to see my friend Abbott Gregory of Conception Abbey. I teach a course there every other year, and I send out emails preparing for conception to the students. They never fail to read those emails. I asked the abbot, what did you pray for as you became the spiritual leader of your community. And he offered this answer. Wisdom, <clears throat> compassion, and patience. He had them in the right order, it seemed. 
wisdom, compassion, mm -hmm. patience. I couldn't resist asking, why patience? Uh. <laughs> <laughs> I work with monks, he said. <laughs> Not known for rapid change. <laughs> I've tried to follow his pattern. And I sense that the leadership of the minister's council has as well. Seeking wisdom. I recommend the abbot's prayer for us all as we seek to live in our own time wisely, which Diana Butler Bass says is the most urgent spiritual practice to learn to live in our own time wisely. Mm. I have a pastor friend in Kansas who's been struggling with change in the congregation, and he has a funny line. When the 50s come back around, wow. we'll be ready. <laughs> but our texts, our texts would point us forward. God is making all things new by gathering up all that has gone before into God's eschatological future. Wine and wineskins have both temporal uses and eternal significance. Discerning how the old and the new are being transformed together, what needs to be pruned, what needs to be strengthened, is our challenge. And God has granted us the spirit and one another for this task. For the minister's council, you are making both new wine and new wine skins while preserving the old. The charism that brought you together. You are discerning the unique value. Deborah spoke of that today. The unique value that you can create for the long term. Those of you who know something about uh, improv know that la the language of improv speaks about an offer more than a request. Perhaps when we think about the renewal of our institutions, our organizations, we need to ask the question, what is the coherent set of offerings that we are making? What are we doing to enrich and serve? How are we as an organization connecting with peoples, with ministers, holy longings? There are holy longings within ministers. Friendship support, opportunity for Sabbath, study, encouragement. The body of Christ and the larger social landscape needs you. If you went away, something large would be missing. And that's always what an institution, an organization has to ask of itself. If we were not doing what we're doing, what would be lost? What would be absent? Where would there be this gap? So, pour new wine into flexible wineskins, oh. maybe standing rules. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Pour new wine, Pour new wine. 
align purpose and risk. Mm-hmm. Align them. Mm-hmm. We cannot be risk averse mm-hmm. and move into God's future. Mm-hmm. And trust the holy nudge of the Spirit. Now. Mm-hmm. Yes. Who continues to be God's instrument. You help us. Mm-hmm. To make all things new. Mm-hmm. So that the old and the new, so both are preserved. Mm-hmm. Amen. Amen. Amen.